John Ossoff joins us now. Thank you so much for your time. Now, Georgia may be on the verge of turning blue for the first time in a presidential race since 1992 with Bill Clinton. Currently, Joe Biden is up by more than 10,000 votes. That race appears to be headed for a recount. But you receive roughly 100,000 votes less than Biden. So in your mind, how does this race change in January when there's no presidential ticket on the ballot? How do you get those 100,000 voters to put a check next to your name? And also, how do you get voters to turn out again when the White House isn't on the line. Well, that doesn't worry me at all, Lindsay, and thank you so much for having me. But first of all, there is no enthusiasm in Georgia, even among Republican voters, for incumbent Senators David Perdue or Kelly Leffler. These are two of the most notoriously corrupt, self-dealing politicians in America. And those who came out and voted for him weren't motivated because they support Leffler and Perdue. They were voting in the presidential race. Meanwhile, Georgia Democrats have tremendous momentum. We're invigorated by our success here. This has been a 10-year effort to register voters, organize, train volunteers as a state becomes younger and more diverse. And we're ready to proceed and win these runoff elections to ensure that we can get out of this crisis, control this pandemic, and pass economic relief for working families and small businesses. But if I can just push back for a moment, because Purdue did receive 90,000 more votes than you did last week. So what will change in January? And how will you try to convince Republicans who may be on the fence to give you a chance instead of having potentially checks and balances in place on the Biden pre presidency? Because there may have been voters, Lindsay, coming out to vote to reelect Donald Trump. Those voters aren't coming out to vote to reelect David Perdue. David Perdue, who had more money spent on his behalf by national Republicans than I think any incumbent Republican senator, failed to secure a majority of support. He was considered a lock to cruise easily to reelection eight months ago. But his personal misconduct, his persistent lying to the people on the COVID 19 pandemic, his refusal even to debate me in public, to hold town hall meetings to answer basic questions about his record, uh, put him in an extraordinarily weak position heading into this runoff. Meanwhile, Georgia Democrats, as I said, have tremendous momentum. And let's not lose sight of the stakes. We're still in the midst of a health crisis. We're still in the midst of an economic crisis. That's what Georgia voters are focused on. And in order for us to get out of this crisis, we need to be able to govern. And that means we need to win these two elections. Now, the president still not accepting the election results yet. What, if any, impact do you think that that could have on your race? Well, I think that Senator Perdue is going to need to make a decision pretty quickly. Is he going to continue to indulge this temper tantrum that the president's throwing uh, and go down with the ship? Or is he going to assert any measure of independence? He's failed for the last four years to show any spine to ever break with this president. He's sold out our state and our values with his loyalty to Donald Trump. And it appears now he may still lack the courage to say anything crosswise with the president. In 2016, 22% of eligible voters in Georgia were not registered to vote. This year, that number decreased to just 2%. Many credit the work of Stacey Abrams. In your eyes, is that increase in registration what appears to have turned your state blue? And, and what role do you see organizations like hers playing ahead of January? Well, Stacey is incredible and brilliant, and she's done brilliant work here in Georgia for the last decade. And what we're seeing is several different things unfolding at the same time. A state becoming younger and more diverse and more dynamic every day. Plus the investment in infrastructure, organizing and registration led by folks like Stacy, and these highly competitive elections that we've had for the last several years to build infrastructure. All of that during a time of political awakening and political realignment. The Trump presidency, shook many people out of their slumber and into civic engagement. And most of all, this pandemic brought home what the human consequences are when we have leaders who are incompetent at governing and fundamentally dishonest with the American people during a crisis. And what we need to do now is eject those leaders who have badly misled us, who have denied and downplayed the scope of the threat to our health, who have failed to deliver the kind of economic relief that we need. And we need to pass substantial measures to jumpstart this economy help working families and small businesses that are struggling, empower the CDC, for example, based here in Georgia, and public health experts and doctors across the country to fight this pandemic. Now, three years ago, you ran for the House and lost. It was the first House seat up for grabs after the 2016 election and gained national attention with millions of dollars flowing in. How do you balance nationalizing the runoff and the benefits that would bring versus the criticism that comes with that? Your opponent's campaign has already said that a vote for you is a vote to hand power to Chuck Schumer and the radical Democrats. 
Yeah, you're going to hear all those typical nationalized arguments. I mean, look, it is inevitable that this race becomes nationalized to an extent because there are national implications. What I'm doing is staying focused on the stakes, and the stakes are both national and local. Here are the stakes. There are hundreds of thousands of American lives that still hang in the balance if we fail to properly respond to this pandemic. The Biden administration can't do it alone. The president-elect will need Congress to respond to this pandemic. The president-elect will need Congress to pass substantial economic relief that rushes help to struggling families and businesses, that invests in infrastructure to create jobs and get this economy moving again. And millions of jobs and livelihoods, foreclosures, evictions are all on the line. That's what this is about. Will we take the steps necessary to recover from COVID-19 and invest in economic recovery? Or will we be mired in partisan gridlock at the hands of the very people whose personal ethical failures and lack of policy vision made this crisis so much worse and have left us in this mess? I want to just get your response on Senators Perdue and Leffler, who are out now with a statement this afternoon calling for the Republican Secretary of State to resign, citing his mismanagement and lack of transparency. I should note there are no credible reports of fraud in Georgia and no outstanding lawsuits. How would you rate his job performance? Well, I think that Georgia election officials over the last 10 years have faced warranted criticism for voter suppression. And the work of people like Stacey Abrams has secured ballot access for hundreds of thousands of Georgians who might otherwise have been able to participate in elections. And Stacey Abrams deserves the lion's share of the credit for enhancing access to the franchise and defending the sacred right to vote here in Georgia. And that work continues. And our work to protect voting rights and defend voting rights will continue through January. And, and lastly, John, this is just really an aside. Uh, many people have been crediting the legacy uh, of John Lewis. Is, is that him in the picture right over your shoulder, kind of serving as a bridge? Yes, it is. And my, my first ever exposure to public service or experience around politics was working as a very, very young man for Congressman Lewis. Uh, and he was my mentor for 17 years and had a profound influence on my worldview, uh, my conviction that it's about making sure every family can access the basics, affordable housing, affordable health care, dignified work that pays a living wage, voting rights and equal justice. And, and this image depicts him bridging the chasm with his body so that people can access the ballot box. And that's, of course, about his leadership across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, 55 years ago, and also about his enduring legacy helping to secure voting rights for more and more Americans, a struggle that continues to this day. And I'll just close with this, Lindsay, and thank you again for having me. If we're going to pass a new Voting Rights Act, if we're going to expand voting rights for all eligible voters in this country, we need to be able to do that in the United States Senate. We need to win these elections. John Ossoff, we thank you so much for your time. Hope you'll come back on the show before the election. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.